Replayability is important for video games. For many people, it's an important factor for judging the quality of a game. Replaying it allows players to understand the game better. Sometimes, there might be poor decisions the developers make that people might find on multiple playthroughs. And sometimes, games reward the player by playing multiple times, such as buffs, different endings, and routes. Let's talk about replayability in single-player games. There's so many genres in single-player games. This could be your regular RPG, the platformer, the open-world game. Whatever the case may be, games in these categories can be enjoyed in one playthrough to the fullest. Pokemon, Persona, Zelda, Mario. Solid game franchises. For me, many times I enjoyed these games in bursts. I play through the game entirely and then stop for a while. I play the games again and then I stop. That's because most of the things in the game are set out the same every time. The dungeons are the same. The story many times is the same. If I played the game over and over again, I would easily get burnt out, just like anyone would. If I have time to take a break from that game, I would obviously not get burnt out as easily, and maybe appreciate the finer extra things that the developers and the writers put in. When I played Persona 4, spoiler kinda, when the gang went to Tatsumi Port Island, the setting of its prequel, Persona 3, Risei was able to get a room in the club because they owed her a favor when her gig was cancelled due to a power outage. When I played Persona 3, there was a boss that also caused a power outage. So when I played the enhancement Persona 4 Golden, and I came to that part again, I felt like it was a really cool reference they put in. In open world games, exploration can also help with replayability. In Breath of the Wild, finding all the Korok seeds, doing all the side quests, doing all the domains, and collecting and maxing out all the gear. You don't need to do these things to get to the true ending, but if you do, it contributes to the replayability and appeals to the completionists in the world. Maybe not the Korok seeds, because collecting them all is a pain in the ass, but collecting all the gear and doing the side quests is rewarding, as many are unique and don't feel too copy and paste. Mario Odyssey kinda has the same feeling, collecting all the purple coins to get all the costumes, getting all the moons and shit. You don't need all the moons in each kingdom to progress and defeat Bowser for the 45th million time, but getting all of them feels like a sense of accomplishment and is something that I and many others go back and play Mario Odyssey for. Also, Balloon Mode is pretty fun too, which further adds to replayability. Different routes are also great for replayability. In SMT Nocturne and 4, there are multiple endings, with no quote-unquote true ending. They're open-ended. Yes, in the community, there are endings that some agree to be the true ending. But even then, it's more widely agreed rather than definite. So it's up to you, the player, to decide which ending is the best. Games like Undertale and Fire Emblem Three Houses also allow you to take different routes to the ending. In Undertale, you can do a genocide, neutral, or pacifist route, which will have drastically different endings to the game. Sense? In Fire Emblem Three Houses, you can choose at the start of the game what house of the three you want to be in which will also have major effects on how the game plays out. And minor spoilers, if you get to a certain part of the game, you'll know what I'm talking about when you get there. There will be a way to get a kinda secret fourth route if you choose a certain house. Again, you'll know what I'm talking about when you get to that part of the game. And finally, the last major thing I want to talk about for replayability, positively, is challenges. This could be upping the difficulty or rules the player enforces on themselves, like Nuzlocke's. Upping the difficulty is simple, make the enemies smarter and or hit harder. In Breath of the Wild Master Mode, many enemies have gold versions of themselves, which are tanky as fuck. Enemies regen health if you don't attack them for a certain amount of time, and you encounter enemies far earlier in the game than normal. In Fire Emblem Three Houses, you can not only up the difficulty, but you can also set the game to classic mode, where if your allies fall in battle, they die and you can't use them again. Nuzlocke's are popular in Pokemon, as they give players a higher difficulty. The rules that are if a Pokemon faints, you can't use it again for the rest of the playthrough. You may only catch the first Pokemon you see in each route, and a bunch more rules like nicknaming each Mon so that if they die they have a bigger emotional impact, only using Mons you got yourself, and not being able to reset your game to a previous state. I remember doing a Nuzlocke with my friends, playing Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire. That shit was super fun and super challenging. A lot of people on YouTube like doing it too such as Jaden Animations and Alpha Red. Speedrunning is good for replayability too, but it's more focused for the hardcore fans of a series or game. It's very competitive because many people compete against each other to see whose time is the fastest. Learning exploits, movement tech, and memorizing optimal paths are all crucial in doing speedruns. Speedrunning is great for replayability, but I would not recommend it for a casual or semi-moderate gamer. 
And of course, because it's so competitive, I don't think there's ever been a case of cheating in speedrunning. Like, ever. Like, ever. On YouTube, you can find plenty of different challenge videos of other games. GameChamp 3000 creates great challenge videos, like trying to beat Splatoon without firing the hero shot, and trying to beat Mario Sunshine without hovering. In story-heavy JRPG games that have a true ending and make players go through the same story over and over again on multiple playthroughs, it's nice to spice things up with different challenges. For the modern Persona series in particular, many people try to beat games only using the starting persona the main character gets, on top of playing on the hardest difficulty. It's challenging because the gameplay heavily focuses on fusing personas to create different, stronger personas. Not to mention that the starting personas, Arsene, Izanagi, and Orpheus, scale horribly. Single player games have lots of opportunities for great replayability. Cool hidden easter eggs, extra things developers put in the game, different routes and challenges all contribute to replayability. Hell, if a game is just fun and creative, that also contributes to the replayability of a game. I 100%ed Mario Galaxy twice, once with Mario and another with Luigi, because the levels were just that fun. Fuck, I want to play that game again. The same thing applies to story-based games. If the story is great, people will be enticed to play it again. I've played Undertale three times now. It's just that great of a story. We talked about the good things. Now, what about the bad or subpar things? I feel like replaying a game entirely just to experience a few tiny things is just kinda pointless. At least that's what I think. In the original Persona 5, I've completed every single confidant except for EYs. I had him on rank 9. If the only thing I wanted to do in Persona 5 was to see the end of his confidant, shouldn't I have just YouTubed it? I mean, at rank 9, his confidant is basically done. He doesn't have a problem he has to deal with anymore. For other games, it's feasible to do the thing you want to do. Oh, you didn't do a domain? Just do it. Oh, you're missing a star? Just get it. But for Persona 5, you have to go through a big chunk of the story, beat some bosses, maybe wait a bit of in-game time, because the confidant only unlocks on a certain day due to its calendar system, go through each of the character's ranks, and then finally get to that part. Obviously, most people won't play the game again just so they can get an extra item or finish a certain confidant, but that's a quote-unquote problem JRPGs that have calendar systems may have to deal with in terms of replayability. If you want to replay a specific part of the game again, unless you have saves, you have to go through so many tasks to play that thing again. For Mario, you just have to select and play the level you want if you beat the game already. In these cases, you don't have to restart the game entirely if you just want to play a certain part of the game again. Three houses? Oh, you want to see all of Marianne's supports because she's best girl and you weren't able to recruit all the support characters in Golden Deer? Well, shit. First, you gotta go pick blue lines so you get the blue line supports automatically. Then, you gotta go through the story. Then, you gotta recruit Marianne herself as well as Ferdinand, Lindhart, and Hanneman if you haven't already in a previous playthrough. Then, you gotta battle using Marianne and hopefully, she's near her support characters so that their relationship can then increase. And then, you have to wait a long time for the time skip to happen because the supports can't progress until after the time skip. And then finally, you'll be able to finish those supports you couldn't before. There are so many things you have to do until you reach that goal. However, most people are not going to play three houses again just to complete a certain support. They'll probably play it to complete multiple supports and experience the gameplay and story from different perspectives. That's what I did. I played the different routes in three houses. Yes, there are many differences between each route, but I felt like pre-time skip, which for me took a little bit over half of a playthrough, followed a very similar formula for each run, only for the major changes to happen just before and after the time skip. I did like playing through three houses in P5 again to experience the gameplay and connect with many of the characters again, but sitting through cutscene after dialogue after cutscene after dialogue of things I've already seen before affected my subsequent playthroughs of each. The thing about Undertale is that it's relatively short. Persona 5 and Fire Emblem Three Houses is long as hell. Plus, there are certain gameplay aspects that you might realize are not that great after you play the game again. When I replayed Persona 5, I didn't like Futaba's or Akumura's palace. I think most people didn't. In Futaba's palace, there are enemies with insta-kill abilities. If they kill Joker out of sheer luck, it doesn't matter if all the other guys in your party have healing or revival abilities, it doesn't matter if your party members can use revival items. You get a game over. 
It's annoying that those enemies have insta-kill abilities, and you have to either get a persona immune to them, or hope and pray that they don't hit you. It's even more annoying that if Joker dies, you have to go back to the last safe room. Fuck this palace. Okumura's is also annoying in terms of design. It just felt very empty and not that creative to me. The enemies and puzzles are annoying to deal with. Compare those two palaces with the first two you encounter in the game, Kamoshida's and Madarame's, with them being very creative and me having a blast going through each one. It just made Futaba's and Okumura's feel like shit in contrast. Genshin Impact is a grindy fuckfest, piece of shit, asshole fucker. At the start of the game, it's like Breath of the Wild. It has an amazing open world and very fun combat. It feels great when you first start playing it, but when you get to late game, holy fuck does it get stale. You do your daily commissions, you use your energy called resin in this game, you do your weekly commissions, do the spiral abyss if you can, and if available, do an event challenge. You log in every day to do the same tasks and log out. To me, it's not fun. It's passable at most. You try to level up your characters, but there are so many resources required and so little resin to get those level ups that you'll probably spend weeks, maybe months, getting the gear you want to do the most damage. The gameplay and the combat is fun at its highest, but at its lowest, it's tedious and grindy. It's a gotcha game, and if you save enough primos, you can get characters from banners. And then, if you want them to actually do something in the game, you need to invest more resources into them. The feeling is great if you pull your waifu or husbando in the gotcha system, but you have to invest so much time every day to get that high, that sometimes it feels like it's not that worth it. Especially if you're free to play. That's not to say the game is bad, far from it, but the tedium in the replayability, to me, hurts the game, and which is why I stay away generally from gacha games. Although I haven't covered every game in every single genre, I think you guys get the idea of replayability. It helps with getting the most out of your game and determining many of its strengths and weaknesses. Some games might have great replayability, and some games might not be as great. There will be a time where beating Bowser and Ganon again and again will get stale. There will be a time where experiencing the same story and things over and over again will get stale. But it's up to the player to decide how much replayability matters to the overall quality of a game. Because at the end of the day, games are an art form. And art is subjective.